our music has to start anyway.
Morning, and welcome to McIver Church. We are happy to have you here this morning on the last Sunday of November. This morning you might have noticed, but the weather outside can be reflected in our building this morning. So please feel free to get a jacket if you need at any point this morning. We hope that you all feel welcome in this place, that we come together to worship and hear from our God. We have some guests joining us in our service today. We will hear from Professor Arlene Friesen from Steinbeck Bible College, and the Ignite team from Steinbeck Bible College will be leading us in worship, and we are happy to have them here this morning. As we enter into a space of worshiping our God, I would like to read a verse from Isaiah 25. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. In perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things plan planned long ago. Let us pray together. Father God, thank you for bringing us here. We are here to worship you and praise your name. You are a good father to us and a provider, and we are ready to hear from you. Bring us new understandings. We worship in recognition of all of this work you are doing in our lives. Bring us closer to you. Amen. Let us worship together. You may stand if you're able. Sing a 
Thank you so much for letting us worship with you today. We bless you and honor you. to 
Steinbeck Bible College's ensemble group this year, and we're going to take a moment to introduce ourselves. I'll start. I'm Hannah. I'm from Leamington, Ontario, the most southern point of Canada. I'm in my first year here, and I came to Steinbeck to pursue biblical studies so I can further my understanding of the Bible and relationship with God. One fun fact about me is that I was actually born here while my father was at, at, was at SBC, so I really feel at home within this community. I am in my first year of three studying to be a counselor at SBC, and I run the Girls' Night program at Flatland Youth for Christ. My name's Mark, and I hail from Thompson, hub of the, uh, hub of the north, Wolf Capital, and <laughs> I'm currently in my second year at the college, and what part of what I'm doing there is I'm a care group leader in the men's dorm. And so it's just a, pri a privilege walking alongside other, other colleagues and students and just being there for them, you know, as a care group leader. And so that's what I've been enjoying, eh, that's what I've been enjoying doing, so. Hi everyone, my name is Kyla. I'm in my second year at SBC. I'm studying for my Associate of Arts in Biblical Studies. Um, I'm actually also from Leamington, Ontario, like Hannah, and like Mark, I'm also a care group leader, which has been a huge blessing for me in my life. I feel so stretched by the Lord, and I've learned so much so far. I think one of the things that I really love about this school that I go to is the passion that I see displayed from the students, like these wonderful people here uh, for the Lord every day. Theme of remembering our creator. Um, yeah, we are so excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ignite, for opening it up, us up this morning and allowing us to have an invitation to grow closer to God. Before we begin our community news and announcements, we will take an offering. Let us consider what we have to offer up at this time, also in prayer, and let's pray to enter this time. Father God, our hearts are full of gratitude. Allow us to be willing and generous in all that we do. We ask for your blessing in our lives and allow us to serve you as best as we can. Multiply our offerings and use them to further your work here on earth and in your kingdom.
At this time, preschool kids are dismissed for supervised playtime. And here are some announcements for our morning. There is a 55 plus walk and talk Christmas lunch planned for December 5th. And there will be a blue Christmas service at McIver on December 21st at 7 p.m. This is a service recognizing hope and healing during the Christmas season. There are a couple unique ways you might be led to serve in our church and community. We are currently looking for some volunteers to sew some nativity costumes for Christmas Eve. Please contact Judy if you are interested. And as we have done before, we are collecting a variety of items for Madison House. And the Madison House Christmas party will be on December 9th from 10 to 11. There is a sign-up sheet looking for people to join for carols at the collection table in the foyer. There has also been an invitation extended from River East Church to join and hear a message on how their church came to its inclusive statement. This is today at 7 p.m. at River East Church, if you are interested. As always, more information on these announcements can be found in our weekly email and the bulletin. One announcement that did not make it into the bulletin is that on Sunday, December 10th, there will be a brief congregational meeting following the service to provide an update regarding the lead pastor position. That is on December 10th, following the service. Also, following the service today, all are invited to our festive family fun day, taking place in the gym, where there will, there will be lunch and a variety of activities that are open to all. Because of this event, there will be no Sunday school held. Let's consider all of these items and service opportunities as we pray together. Father God, we ask that you meet us here and allow us time to process the many ways that you are at work in our lives. Every day, every minute, and every second. You are present and you are good. We look forward to what you have prepared for us. We lift up these announcements we've heard this morning and the announcements that are on our hearts. We pray for our event following our service today. Bring the right people in these doors and bless these connections. We lift up our church community. Allow us to serve each other in our church. We lift, we lift up our neighborhood community and other churches around us. Allow us to serve each other in our community. We lift up our city and our world. Allow us to serve and follow the example you have given to us. Allow us to teach and be taught. And allow us to learn from our mistakes and have grace for one another. Amen. I would like to invite up Pastor Kim for our scripture reading this morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone today again. Um, what a treat to have Steinbeck Bible College with us this morning. And in just a few minutes, uh, or just not minutes, it won't take me that long. In just a few moments, Arlene uh, Friesen, one of their professors, is going to share the message with us. And Arlene is here with her husband, Jacob. And so welcome to you this morning as well. So the scripture reading this morning is from Revelation 21, verses 1 to 6, and Revelation 22, verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud, a loud shout from the throne, saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, 
or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. And Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down from the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God, who inspires his prophets, has sent his angel to tell his servants of what will happen soon. The word of the Lord. Morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to be with the singing congregation. <clears throat> that was so fantastic. Um, and so I asked Ignite if they would be willing to sing Is He Worthy again at the end. Because I could hear you guys singing along, and you weren't sure if you had permission to. And it would, and it would tie up what we're talking about this morning so well. So just a heads up to the people back there. Um, I would also like to introduce Melissa Duick. Wave your hand or something. <laughs> Melissa is also on faculty at Steinbeck Bible College. She's our music specialist. She's a full-time worship pastor as well. Um, and she's here with her family this morning. So welcome to you. And she's, so she's trained this group. <clears throat> and, and is also the musician you heard on the track. So... <laughs> What you do when you have a, sm a smaller college, you, you improvise, and it, and it works. Um, yeah, so we at Steinbeck Bible College are training students and empowering them to follow Jesus, to serve the church, and to engage the world. Uh, and we do that in a few different ways, either for students who are headed towards university. We have programs to prepare them for university and also for maximum transfers. For students who are interested in some kind of vocational training, we have a program where they can do that in conjunction with some biblical studies. And then kind of the foundation of who we are as a Bible college is our biblical studies track with options in counseling, youth ministry, worship, pastoral, cross-cultural, and Bible teaching. So that's who we are as a college. Um, and yeah, we just love to to work with young people and encourage them in their walk with, with God, getting to know him better, and growing in confidence as servant leaders. I've been at the college for about 15 years. My husband and I moved here from southern Ontario, where we had been for 19 years, working in a Mennonite church in, in the peninsula there, in Aylmer, Ontario. And... This is kind of home country for me. I grew up in Blumenort, going to Steinbach Bible College, where we met. It's a good place to meet people. Um, but it's, it's been a real joy to be back teaching and serving in that way. <clears throat> you may hear that I'm a little hoarse this morning, so we're praying for God's mercies on that. Let's, let's open with prayer. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. 
our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When you envision the happy reunion beyond the grave, who do you most look forward to seeing? <laughs> I've got the right answer already. <laughs> I was going to suggest some of you might be looking forward to seeing your spouse or a child taken too soon, a parent or a grandparent, a beloved friend, or as somebody already suggested, Jesus. Can you even begin to imagine a future in which you will come face to face with the God who told Moses that no one can see my face and live. This is the terrifyingly glorious vision revealed to John in these verses that Pastor Kim read for us. For this aging church leader stuck in exile on the island of Patmos, while the churches under his care in Asia Minor were facing the persecution of the Roman Empire and the temptation to compromise with the world, this vision calmed his anxious questions. And I think they are questions we also ask. How can we stay faithful to the lamb in a world where the beast still plies his evil? How can we endure to the end when so many are falling away? I remember a friend who said to me, kind of in a season of some doubt or wrestling in her faith, and just said, I don't want to lose Jesus. At SBC this year, our student council has set our theme for the year as remembering our creator, and you'll hear that in the final song, Ignite Sings, today. And so we've been thinking through the story of, of the Bible. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and you find no pleasure in them, right? Before you get old and everything starts falling apart, essentially, is what the preacher says in Ecclesiastes. Well, how can we do that? How can we remember our creator, loving God with everything we have and each other as ourselves, when disordered loves for creation and ourselves tempt and twist our souls? The revelation of Jesus Christ, recorded by John, paints many different pictures intending to inspire faith, hope, and love. But in chapters 21 to 22, we have the glorious climax, not just to this letter, but to the whole grand story of God beginning in Genesis. Don't worry, you're getting the Reader's Digest condensed version here this morning. <clears throat> but we are going to go back to the beginning because John paints a picture in which we see the Creator making all things new. Heaven and earth are reunited in the new Jerusalem, realizing Eden's garden temple purpose of being the holy place where God is present with his people. And we worship. So I want to unpack a couple of images John has for us in, the, in this text. But first, just a bit of an overview. So in chapter 21, verses 1 to 5, which Pastor Kim read, if you've got your Bibles, I really encourage you to have them open because I'm going to refer to this whole text, not just what was read. Uh, John sees a new heaven and a new earth. And then secondly, he says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down looking like a bride. So you've got this mix of images, right? A new heaven, a new earth, a city that looks like a bride prepared to meet her husband. And then there are two announcements from the one on the throne. First of all, God is now dwelling with his people. This theme is front and center in importance. God is going to pitch his tent with us just like he did with the tabernacle in the wilderness. Second, God is making all things new. Even now, God is doing this work. It's a present tense verb. The biblical story begins with creation, and it ends with creation. And then God says, these words are trustworthy and true. 
And the angel repeats that in 22, verse 6. These words are trustworthy and true. You can stake your life on these words. John then goes on to unpack these images, giving us three key truths about the New Jerusalem. And the first is that the New Jerusalem is the restored Eden. When we go back to the beginning of the story, we see that God's story begins with temple building. Maybe you're familiar with that idea in Genesis chapter 1. I heard a pastor in our church preach on that some years back, and it and it just like opened up the story of Genesis 1 for me to see it as a temple story. In Genesis 1, God is creating a place in which his glory will dwell. First verse says, the earth was formless and void, without form and empty. And what does God do? He creates the forms of the temple and then he fills and furnishes them. And the form of this temple is a garden filled with plants and animals, and watered with a great river. And then God lights the garden temple with the greater and lesser lights, which we know as the sun and moon. They're not named there, probably so that people would be tempted to worship them. And the final thing God does, which happens in a temple, is you put the image of the God in the temple, and God puts his image in the garden temple. Humankind, created in the image of God, male and female. And God dwells with his people there. A temple is where you go to meet with God. The the presence of God is in a temple. So Eden was this garden temple intended to expand and fill the earth. But instead, as we know, humans rebelled and were driven out of this temple, out of the sanctuary. Heaven and earth separated in an ever-expanding universe are they never more to meet again well if we read the last chapter of the story revelation 22 we see some parallels to that first garden first of all we see a river of life flowing out from under the throne 22 verse 1 in genesis 2 verse 10 we heard that there was a river flowing out of eden And then in Ezekiel 47, the prophet reminds us that when the new temple is built, there will be a river flowing from beneath that temple running down to the sea. The sea is the Dead Sea, so full of mineral salt, and some of you probably experienced this, I'm guessing, that when you try to swim, you just bob along the surface. It's impossible to swim because you're too high up in the water, right? So this Dead Sea the vision says, is going to become a place where every one of you who loves to fish would love to fish because it will be teeming with fish. Ezekiel says, everything lives where the river goes. What else do we see in chapter 22 that reminds us of the garden? Well, on either side of the river is the tree of life. Along the riverbanks in Ezekiel's vision are many kinds of fruit trees that never wither and bear fruit every month. And we have that vision here in Revelation 22 as well. It's not many different kinds of trees here, but one kind, the tree of life, producing fruit every month and healing the nations with its leaves. We sure need that, don't we? Where did we first see the tree of life? In Genesis 2, life in its fullness, available physically and spiritually, available to humankind as long as they remained obedient to God. But access to that tree was taken away when Adam and Eve sinned. Praise God, access to the tree is now opened by the second Adam, Jesus Christ. So we've got the river, we have the tree, we have light in this temple, in this garden. But instead of the greater and lesser lights, 21 verse 23 says, the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the lamb. And finally, in this restored Eden, people fulfill their creational calling to serve 
as priests and kings, we worship God and, and we reign with him. Isn't that incredible? The servants will worship him, verse 3, verse 5, and they will reign forever and ever. This is what we were created for, to govern creation for the glory of God, to be fruitful, and to worship God. Well, when that original Eden was closed off to humans, God's presence and power first was mediated to people through the tabernacle. That's where he, he showed up and spoke with them. And then after the tabernacle, a more permanent place was built to house his name and his glory, the temple. But when the temple was destroyed, the word himself came in flesh and as John chapter 1, verse 14 says, he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent. After Jesus' ascension, we see in Peter and in Paul and Ephesians 2 that the church carries the awesome privilege of being God's temple, a dwelling place for God, a holy place for God. So we have this whole temple narrative in scripture, from the garden, to the tabernacle, to the temple, to Jesus, to the church. And what do we find here in these chapters? 21, 22, no temple. I saw no temple in the city. Well, why not? If the temple imagery has been so important throughout the scripture, why is it absent here? Or is it? We look at chapter 21, verses 9 to 23, and the vision John has of this new Jerusalem, we see that it is depicted as being God's worldwide temple. It's this mixed up image, right? 21, verse 9, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me a bride? No, a city. <laughs> As so often in John, it's like you hear one thing and then you see another thing, right? It's these coming together of two images. Showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It is both the people of God and the place where he dwells, the temple. <clears throat> and we see this in the way the city is described. If we look at the measurements of it, like why tell us about the measurements, right? Does it really matter? But verse 16, the angel is measuring this. And the city lies four square, its length the same of its, as its width. It's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. That's an interesting city. It's a cube. Which other place in the Bible is described as a cube? Anyone want to hazard a guess? The Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of the temple. In 1 Kings 6, verse 20, it's 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits and overlaid with pure gold. It was where God's presence symbolically dwelt. It's a tiny space, but now vastly expanded to encompass the world. And this city here in Revelation is not just overlaid with gold, but it's constructed from a gold so pure that it is clear as glass. Verse 18, the city is pure gold, not just overlaid with it. What else do we see about how the city is constructed? It's got 12 foundations, verse 14 says, and then in verse 19, it describes these foundations and says, they are adorned with precious jewels. And then he names all the jewels. And if we go back and look at Aaron's breastplate in the Old Testament, we'd see that these are, uh, if not identical, but very similar to the 12 stones which were in Aaron's breastplate. Those 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And we have these 12 foundations with these jewels. But here, the foundations are inscribed with the 12 apostles of the Lamb and the gates of the city, also 12, are inscribed with the tribes of Israel, which tells us that this city represents the whole people of God. 
the people of the Old Covenant and of the New Covenant. Instead of lamps or a Christ candle like some churches have, representing the presence of God, in this, te in this temple city, the light is the Lamb. There's no longer any need of sun or moon. The Lamb has been revealed as the very glory of God, the brilliance of his light. Could there be a higher view of Christ than that he is the glory of God himself? So we see in the measurements, in the material, in the lighting, the new Jerusalem is God's worldwide temple, and that's why there's no need for a temple. Which makes sense. But then I was confused by the next statement that says... Its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. If the temple is the place where God dwells, how can he also be the temple? And I think John is trying to describe something that is difficult to explain. So I want to try. This is how I see it anyway. In the old creation, creation is outside of God and sustained by him. But now in John's vision, creation is no longer outside of God. The temple is not outside of God. It's not a space he enters into to inhabit. Rather, everything is in God. All space is holy. And we see his face everywhere. And so we come to the third truth about the New Jerusalem. It's God's restored Eden. It's God's worldwide temple, and the most precious truth of all, it is the unmediated presence of God. 21 verse 3, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. 22 verses 3 and 4. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. In the New Jerusalem, God dwells with us, not in a separate holy place. We dwell in God, and he dwells in us. This is complete and intimate union. Heaven and earth, which were separated by the fall of humanity and the resulting curse, are reunited. There's no curse here. Elias Dummer has a song called Echoing Holy with this lyric in it. I love the image. Heaven and earth collide. The choir of creation, it bursts to life. When heaven and earth collide, it will be a glorious union, not a catastrophic meteor accident. It's like you've seen this image probably maybe in a movie or in some picture from World War II. The soldier and his sweetheart. She spots him alighting from the train that has carried him home after years of fighting in a world war, and she goes running full tilt into his arms, and he swoops her up in an exuberant embrace and twirls her around. You've, you've got the image, right? Together at last, heaven and earth united. And where God is in fullness, the curse is gone. Death is gone. Mourning and crying and pain are gone. Like a gentle mother, Jesus picks up his crying child and tenderly wipes away every tear, saying, I have come, and I am with you forevermore. Praise God. He is making all things new. Heaven and earth will be united in the new Jerusalem, becoming the holy place where God is present with his people. And these trustworthy and true words call forth from us faith. I think in songs, I think maybe because I'm a musical person, but when I was thinking about this, I thought of Lauren Daigle's song, Look Up, Child. 
She asks these lamenting questions at the beginning, but then with the faith-filled chorus, look up, child. But the question's like, where are you now when darkness seems to win? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? And I was playing the song on YouTube, and I just started scrolling down through the comments, which is sometimes interesting. Um, and they were here. And the, these are some of the comments. I just found out I lost my baby at eight weeks pregnant. Holding this miracle and never being able to meet him or her, this song helps me. God will heal, and he has a plan for me. Look up, child. My daddy's in the hospital in another city with his lungs 75% compromised due to COVID-19. He loves this song, and now, more than ever, it has become my daily prayer. Look up, child. I'm nine, and I get stressed with all my homework. But I put on this song to help me. Look up, child. I remember the first time I heard his voice in a dark, abundant house full of glasses and dirt as I was smoking weed. That night was different. He was all I could see with my tears rushing down my cheeks. I needed him more than the drugs, and he saved me. His voice has brought me back to life. I no longer smoke or drink. I live for him and him alone. Look up, child. Where are you now? When the world is crumbling. When our hearts and eyes look up to the sovereign God and the sacrificed, risen, and ascended Lamb of God on the throne, we are strengthened to trust more and to walk in faithful obedience here where the beast is still active. And this is the importance of worship and the preaching of the word to illuminate for us a vision of God that leads us to trust and thus to transformation in his image. These trustworthy and true words call forth faith. These trustworthy and true words call forth hope. Doesn't your heart thrill to the promise that God is making all things new? When we've got that hope, that helps us to joyfully endure to the end. I mean, that's the message of Revelation, right? This calls for the faithful endurance of the saints. When we have that hope, we're determined to be ready for the wedding feast. Without the hope that good will triumph, we would succumb to pressing evil. But because we know that we will be like him, seeing him as he is, we purify ourselves even now. And so we get on with our task, remembering our creator, bringing about the character of the new Jerusalem in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our making money, in our investing money. In everything we do, we serve God and mediate his presence to our world. Finally, these trustworthy and true words call forth love. Think about our gathering here in worship and the ultimate gathering in the new heaven and new earth. When we come together to worship, we gather to reflect to each other the glory of God. What you see on my face, in my life, in my worship, is one facet of God's glory. But what I see in you is another facet. Now, I don't know you here, but you could look around and think about the glory you see in the people with whom you worship. Maybe it's the one who lovingly and gently cares for a mother with dementia. The one who delights in noticing God's beautiful birds. The child who exudes compassion. The tenor singing out praises. I heard at least one of those here today. The techies who pursue excellence in live streaming as their way of loving the church. Every one of you reflects God's glory in such a way that together we see and know and love more of who God is than we ever could on our own. 
In Revelation 21, 24 to 26, we see that the same is true on a larger scale of the nations, the peoples and cultures and civilizations of the world. It says that they bring their glory into the city. I imagine that means they bring in all that is good and God-honoring from their culture and their civilization. Maybe that includes things like German engineering, Latino warmth and affection, Middle Eastern hospitality, African color and dance, Cree sense of humor and care for creation. I think that's going to be there. Low German Mennonite simplicity and food without its artery-clogging tendencies. <laughs> Each people group brings in its glory and honor, reflecting the glory of God, and we see more of that glory. If we thought it could only be seen in our people group, we would have such a limited view of God, which I think is one reason why racism is such an ugly evil. It prevents us from seeing the glory of God in all its facets. Oh, beloved, if we could recapture a sense of awe and amazement that God in his radiant perfection graces the church with his own glory and brilliance, and that he longs for us as a groom for his bride, we will be enabled by his limitless love to love him with our whole beings and to love each other in reflected glory. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, that is our prayer. We praise you that you are in the business of making all things new. Our world desperately needs you. Let us be a people characterized by faith, hope, and love, living out the life of the new Jerusalem in our daily lives the new creation already taking root in our hearts and lives so that we might be a witness of your glory, drawing many other people to come and join in the worship of the Lamb before the throne of God. This we pray for the sake of your glory and the increase of your kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Professor Arlene. Um, so once again, my name is Kyla. This next song that we're about to sing paints for us a beautiful picture of the great love of our creator, as Professor Arlene talked about just now. Um, we hope that you can join us together in opening our hearts and reflecting on this great love, um, and we hope that you enjoy our next song, Multiplied. Surely come find us 
Okay, thank you so much, MPC Church. Um, again, we are Ignite, and we're just so glad to be here, to be in worship. And yeah, but just in case, if you guys would like to learn more or to chat with us, there is a booth in, just in the foyer that you can't miss. So, and the next song that we're going to be doing is called Psalm 150. And pretty much it's, you know, about praising God, praising the Lord, and it connects well with our theme that we have at the college, and we hope that you enjoy. Sing His greatness. 
for our last song, we're going to do Is He Worthy? So you can stand if you'd like for the last song.
Thank you again, Ignite, for leading us in worship this morning and joining us here. And thank you, Professor Arlene, for joining us and giving us much to think about as we take a closer look at the scripture. Just a reminder, there is no Sunday school following the service, and all are welcome to join in the gym for our festive family fun day. For the benediction, I would like to read and bless you with these words from the book of Romans. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rules, nor things present nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.